Chapter 7 of The Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain. Chapter 7. Margaret announced a party and invited forty people. The date for it was seven days away. This was a fine opportunity. Margaret's house stood by itself, and it could be easily watched. All the week it was watched, night and day. Margaret's household went out and in, as usual, but they carried nothing in their hands, and neither they nor others brought anything to the house. This was ascertained. Evidently rations for forty people were not being fetched. If they were furnished any sustenance, it would have to be made on the premises. It was true that Margaret went out with a basket every evening, but the spies ascertained that she always brought it back empty. The guests arrived at noon and filled the place. Father Adolf followed, also after a little, the astrologer, without invitation. The spies had informed him that neither at the back nor the front had any parcels been brought in. He entered and found the eating and drinking going on finely, and everything progressing in a lively and festive way. He glanced around and perceived that many of the cooked delicacies and all of the native and foreign fruits were of a perishable character, and he also recognized that these were fresh and perfect. No apparitions, no incantations, no thunder. That settled it. This was witchcraft, and not only that, but of a new kind, a kind never dreamed of before. It was a prodigious power, an illustrious power. He resolved to discover its secret. The announcement of it would resound throughout the world, penetrate to the remotest lands, paralyze all the nations with amazement, and carry his name with it, and make him renowned forever. It was a wonderful piece of luck, a splendid piece of luck. The glory of it made him dizzy. All the house made room for him. Margaret politely seated him. Ursula ordered Gottfried to bring a special table for him. Then she decked it and furnished it and asked for his orders. "'Bring me what you will,' he said. The two servants brought supplies from the pantry, together with white wine and red, a bottle of each. The astrologer, who very likely had never seen such delicacies before, poured out a beaker of red wine, drank it off, poured another, then began to eat with a grand appetite. I was not expecting Satan, for it was more than a week since I had seen or heard of him. But now he came in. I knew it by the feel, though people were in the way and I could not see him. I heard him apologizing for intruding, and he was going away, but Margaret urged him to stay, and he thanked her and stayed. She brought him along, introducing him to the girls and to Meidling and to some of the elders, and there was quite a rustle of whispers. It's the young stranger we hear so much about and can't get sight of. He is away so much. Dear, dear, but he is beautiful. What is his name? Philip Traum. Ah, it fits him. You see, Traum is German for dream. What does he do? Studying for the ministry, they say. His face is his fortune. He'll be a cardinal some day. Where is his home? Away down somewhere in the tropics, they say. He has a rich uncle down there. And so on. He made his way at once. Everybody was anxious to know him and talk with him. Everybody noticed how cool and fresh it was all of a sudden, and wondered at it, for they could see that the sun was beating down the same as before outside, and the sky was clear of clouds, but no one guessed the reason, of course. The astrologer had drunk his second beaker. He poured out a third. He set the bottle down, and by accident overturned it. He seized it before much was spilled, and held it up to the light, saying, What a pity! It is royal wine. Then his face lighted with joy, or triumph, or something, and he said, Quick, bring a bowl! It was brought, a four-quart one. He took up that two-pint bottle, and began to pour. 
went on pouring, the red liquor gurgling and gushing into the white bowl, and rising higher and higher up its sides, everybody staring and holding their breath, and presently the bowl was full to the brim. Look at the bottle, he said, holding it up. It is full yet. I glanced at Satan, and in that moment he vanished. Then Father Adolf rose up, flushed and excited, crossed himself, and began to thunder in his great voice, This house is bewitched and accursed! People began to cry and shriek, and crowd toward the door. I summoned this detected household to— His words were cut off short. His face became red, then purple, but he could not utter another sound. Then I saw Satan, a transparent film, melt into the astrologer's body. And then the astrologer put up his hand, and apparently in his own voice said, Wait, remain where you are. All stopped where they stood. Bring a funnel. Ursula brought it trembling and scared, and he stuck it in the bottle, and took up the great bowl, and began to pour the wine back, the people gazing and dazed with astonishment, for they knew the bottle was already full before he began. He emptied the whole of the bowl into the bottle, then smiled out over the room, chuckled, and said indifferently, "'It is nothing. Anybody can do it. With my powers I can even do much more.' A frightened cry burst out everywhere. "'Oh, my God, he is possessed!' And there was a tumultuous rush for the door, which swiftly emptied the house of all who did not belong in it except us boys and Midling. We boys knew the secret, and would have told it if we could, but we couldn't. We were very thankful to Satan for furnishing that good help at the needful time. Margaret was pale and crying. Meidling looked kind of petrified. Ursula the same, but Godfried was the worst. He couldn't stand. He was so weak and scared, for he was of a witch family, you know, and it would be bad for him to be suspected. Agnes came loafing in, looking pious and unaware, and wanted to rub up against Ursula and be petted. But Ursula was afraid of her, and shrank away from her, but pretending she was not meaning any incivility, for she knew very well it wouldn't answer to have strange relations with that kind of a cat. But we boys took Agnes and petted her, for Satan would not have befriended her if he had not had a good opinion of her, and that was endorsement enough for us. He seemed to trust anything that hadn't the moral sense. Outside the guests, panic-stricken, scattered in every direction, and fled in a pitiable state of terror, and such a tumult as they made with their running and sobbing and shrieking and shouting, that soon all the village came flocking from their houses to see what had happened. And they thronged the street, and shouldered, and jostled one another in excitement and fright. And then Father Adolf appeared, and they fell apart in two walls like the cloven red sea. And presently down this lane the astrologer came, striding and mumbling, and where he passed the lanes surged back in packed masses, and fell silent with awe and their eyes stared, and their breasts heaved, and several women fainted. And when he was gone by, the crowd swarmed together and followed him at a distance, talking excitedly and asking questions and finding out the facts, finding out the facts and passing them on to others with improvements, improvements which soon enlarged the bowl of wine to a barrel and made the one bottle hold it all and yet remain empty to the last. When the astrologer reached the market square, he went straight to a juggler, fantastically dressed, who was keeping three brass balls in the air, and took them from him, and faced around upon the approaching crowd, and said, This poor clown is ignorant of his art. Come forward and see an expert perform. So saying, he tossed the balls up one after another, and set them whirling in a slender, bright oval in the air, and added another, then another, and another, and soon, no one seeing whence he got them, adding, 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 the oval lengthening all the time, his hands moving so swiftly that they were just a web or a blur, and not distinguishable as hands, 
and such as counted said there were now a hundred balls in the air the spinning great oval reached up twenty feet in the air and was a shining and glinting and wonderful sight then he folded his arms and told the balls to go on spinning without his help and they did it after a couple of minutes he said there that will do and the oval broke and came crashing down and the balls scattered abroad and rolled every whither and wherever one of them came the people fell back in dread and no one would touch it it made him laugh and he scoffed at the people and called them cowards and old women then he turned and saw the tight-rope and said foolish people were daily wasting their money to see a clumsy and ignorant varlet degrade that beautiful art now they should see the work of a master with that he made a spring into the air and lit firm on his feet on the rope then he hopped the whole length of it back and forth on one foot with his hands clasped over his eyes and next he began to throw somersaults both backward and forward and threw twenty-seven the people murmured for the astrologer was old and always before had been halting of movement and at times even lame but he was nimble enough now and went on with his antics in the liveliest manner finally he sprang lightly down and walked away and passed up the road and around the corner and disappeared then that great pale silent solid crowd drew a deep breath and looked into one another's faces as if they said was it real did you see it or was it only i and was i dreaming then they broke into a low murmur of talking and fell apart in couples and moved toward their homes still talking in that awed way with faces close together and laying a hand on an arm and making other such gestures as people make when they have been deeply impressed by something we boys followed behind our fathers and listened catching all we could of what they said and when they sat down in our house and continued their talk they still had us for company they were in a sad mood for it was certain they said that disaster for the village must follow this awful visitation of witches and devils then my father remembered that father adolf had been struck dumb at the moment of his denunciation they have not ventured to lay their hands upon an anointed servant of god before he said and how they could have dared it this time i cannot make out for he wore his crucifix isn't it so yes said the others we saw it it is serious friends it is very serious always before we had a protection it has failed the others shook as with a sort of chill and muttered those words over it has failed god has forsaken us it is true said seppi wolmeyer's father there is nowhere to look for help the people will realize this said nicholas's father the judge and despair will take away their courage and their energies we have indeed fallen upon evil times he sighed and wolmeyer said in a troubled voice the report of it all will go about the country and our village will be shunned as being under the displeasure of god the golden stag will know hard times true neighbor said my father all of us will suffer all in repute many in estate and good god what is it that can come to finish us name it um gott's willen the interdict it smote like a thunderclap and they were like to swoon with the terror of it then the dread of this calamity roused their energies and they stopped brooding and began to consider ways to avert it they discussed this that and the other way and talked till the afternoon was far spent then confessed that at present they could arrive at no decision so they parted sorrowfully with oppressed hearts which were filled with bodings while they were saying their parting words i slipped out and set my course for margaret's house to see what was happening there i met many people but none of them greeted me it ought to have been surprising 
but it was not, for they were so distraught with fear and dread that they were not in their right minds, I think. They were white and haggard, and walked like persons in a dream, their eyes open but seeing nothing, their lips moving but uttering nothing, and worriedly clasping and unclasping their hands without knowing it. At Margit's it was like a funeral. She and Wilhelm sat together on the sofa, but said nothing, not even holding hands. Both were steeped in gloom, and Margit's eyes were red from the crying she had been doing. She said, I have been begging him to go and come no more, and so save himself alive. I cannot bear to be his murderer. This house is bewitched, and no inmate will escape the fire. But he will not go, and he will be lost with the rest. Wilhelm said he would not go. If there was danger for her, his place was by her, and there he would remain. Then she began to cry again, and it was all so mournful that I wished I had stayed away. There was a knock now, and Satan came in fresh and cheery and beautiful, and brought that whiny atmosphere of his, and changed the whole thing. He never said a word about what had been happening, nor about the awful fears which were freezing the blood in the hearts of the community, but began to talk and rattle on about all manner of gay and pleasant things, and next about music, an artful stroke which cleared away the remnant of Margaret's depression, and brought her spirits and her interests broad awake. She had not heard any one talk so well and so knowingly on that subject before, and she was so uplifted by it and so charmed that what she was feeling lit up her face and came out in her words. And Wilhelm noticed it and did not look as pleased as he ought to have done. And next Satan branched off into poetry and recited some, and did it well. And Margaret was charmed again, and again. Wilhelm was not as pleased as he ought to have been, and this time Margaret noticed it and was remorseful. I fell asleep to pleasant music that night, the patter of rain upon the panes, and the dull growling of distant thunder. Away in the night Satan came and roused me and said, Come with me. Where shall we go? Anywhere, so it is with you. Then there was a fierce glare of sunlight, and he said, This is China. That was a grand surprise, and made me sort of drunk with vanity and gladness, to think I had come so far, so much, much farther than anybody else in our village, including Bartel Sperling, who had such a great opinion of his travels. We buzzed around over that empire for more than half an hour, and saw the whole of it. It was wonderful. The spectacles we saw, and some were beautiful, others too horrible to think. For instance, however, I may go into that by and by, and also why Satan chose China for this excursion instead of another place. It would interrupt my tale to do it now. Finally we stopped flitting and lit. We sat upon a mountain commanding a vast landscape of mountain range and gorge and valley and plain and river, with cities and villages slumbering in the sunlight, and a glimpse of blue sea on the farther verge. It was a tranquil and dreamy picture, beautiful to the eye and restful to the spirit. If we could only make a change like that whenever we wanted to, the world would be easier to live in than it is, for change of scene shifts the mind's burdens to the other shoulder, and banishes old shop-worn weariness from mind and body both. We talked together, and I had the idea of trying to reform Satan and persuade him to lead a better life. I told him about all those things he had been doing, and begged him to be more considerate and stop making people unhappy. I said I knew he did not mean any harm, but that he ought to stop and consider the possible consequences of a thing before launching it in that impulsive and random way of his. Then he would not make so much trouble. He was not hurt by this plain speech. He only looked amused and surprised, and said, What? I do random things? Indeed, I never do. I stop and consider possible consequences. Where is the need? I know what the consequences are going to be, always. 
oh satan then how could you do these things well i will tell you and you must understand if you can you belong to a singular race every man is a suffering machine and a happiness machine combined the two functions work together harmoniously with a fine and delicate precision on the give and take principle for every happiness turned out in the one department the other stands ready to modify it with a sorrow or a pain maybe a dozen in most cases the man's life is about equally divided between happiness and unhappiness when this is not the case the unhappiness predominates always never the other sometimes a man's make and disposition are such that his misery machine is able to do nearly all the business such a man goes through life almost ignorant of what happiness is everything he touches everything he does brings a misfortune upon him you have seen such people to that kind of a person life is not an advantage is it it is only a disaster sometimes for an hour's happiness a man's machinery makes him pay years of misery don't you know that it happens every now and then i will give you a case or two presently now the people of your village are nothing to me you know that don't you i did not like to speak out too flatly so i said i had suspected it well it is true that they are nothing to me it is not possible that they should be the difference between them and me is abysmal immeasurable they have no intellect no intellect nothing that resembles it at a future time i will examine what man calls his mind and give you the details of that chaos then you will see and understand men have nothing in common with me there is no point of contact they have foolish little feelings and foolish little vanities and impertinences and ambitions their foolish little life is but a laugh a sigh and extinction and they have no sense only the moral sense i will show you what i mean here is a red spider not so big as a pin's head can you imagine an elephant being interested in him caring whether he is happy or isn't or whether he is wealthy or poor or whether his sweetheart returns his love or not or whether his mother is sick or well or whether he is looked up to in society or not or whether his enemies will smite him or his friends desert him or whether his hopes will suffer blight or his political ambitions fail or whether he shall die in the bosom of his family or neglected and despised in a foreign land these things can never be important to the elephant they are nothing to him he cannot shrink his sympathies to the microscopic size of them man is to me as the red spider is to the elephant the elephant has nothing against the spider he cannot get down to that remote level i have nothing against man the elephant is indifferent i am indifferent the elephant would not take the trouble to do the spider an ill turn. If he took the notion, he might do him a good turn, if it came in his way and cost nothing. I have done men good service, but no ill turns. The elephant lives a century, the red spider a day. In power, intellect, and dignity, the one creature is separated from the other by a distance which is simply astronomical. Yet in these, as in all qualities, man is immeasurably further below me than is the wee spider below the elephant. Man's mind clumsily and tediously and laboriously patches little trivialities together and gets a result such as it is my mind creates do you get the force of that creates anything it desires and in a moment creates without material creates fluids solids colors anything 
everything out of the airy nothing which is called thought. A man imagines a silk thread, imagines a machine to make it, imagines a picture, then by weeks of labor embroiders it on canvas with the thread. I think the whole thing, and in a moment it is before you, created. I think a poem, music, the record of a game of chess, anything, and it is there. This is the immortal mind. Nothing is beyond its reach. Nothing can obstruct my vision. The rocks are transparent to me, and darkness is daylight. I do not need to open a book. I take the whole of its contents into my mind at a single glance through the cover, and in a million years I could not forget a single word of it or its place in the volume. Nothing goes on in the skull of man, bird, fish, insect, or other creature which can be hidden from me. I pierce the learned man's brain with a single glance, and the treasures which cost him threescore years to accumulate are mine. He can forget, and he does forget, but I retain. Now then I perceive by your thoughts that you are understanding me fairly well. Let us proceed. Circumstances might so fall out that the elephant could like the spider, supposing he can see it, but he could not love it. His love is for his own kind, for his equals. An angel's love is sublime, adorable, divine, beyond the imagination of man, infinitely beyond it. But it is limited to his own august order. If it fell upon one of your race for only an instant, it would consume its object to ashes. No, we cannot love men, but we can be harmlessly indifferent to them. We can also like them sometimes. I like you and the boys, I like Father Peter, and for your sakes I am doing all these things for the villagers. He saw that I was thinking a sarcasm, and he explained his position. I have wrought well for the villagers, though it does not look like it on the surface. Your race never know good fortune from ill. They are always mistaking the one for the other. It is because they cannot see into the future. What I am doing for the villagers will bear good fruit some day, in some cases to themselves, in others to unborn generations of men. No one will ever know that I was the cause, but it will be none the less true for all that. Among you boys you have a game. You stand a row of bricks on end a few inches apart. You push a brick. It knocks its neighbor over, the neighbor knocks over the next brick, and so on till all the row is prostrate. That is human life. A child's first act knocks over the initial brick, and the rest will follow inexorably. If you could see into the future as I can, you would see everything that was going to happen to that creature, for nothing can change the order of its life after the first event has determined it. That is, nothing will change it, because each act unfailingly begets an act. That act begets another, and so on to the end. And the seer can look forward down the line and see just when each act is to have birth from cradle to grave. Does God order the career? For ordain it? No. The man's circumstances and environment order it. His first act determines the second and all that follow after. But suppose, for argument's sake, that the man should skip one of these acts, an apparently trifling one. For instance, suppose that it had been appointed that on a certain day at a certain hour and minute and second and fraction of a second he should go to the well, and he didn't go. That man's career would change utterly from that moment. Thence to the grave it would be wholly different from the career which his first act as a child had arranged for him. Indeed, it might be that if he had gone to the well he would have ended his career on a throne, and that omitting to do it would set him upon a career that would lead to beggary and a pauper's grave. 
for instance if at any time say in boyhood columbus had skipped the triflingest little link in the chain of acts projected and made inevitable by his first childish act it would have changed his whole subsequent life and he would have become a priest and died obscure in an italian village and america would not have been discovered for two centuries afterward i know this to skip any one of the billion acts in columbus's chain would have wholly changed his life i have examined his billions of possible careers and in only one of them occurs the discovery of america you people do not suspect that all of your acts are of one size and importance but it is true to snatch at an appointed fly is as big with fate for you as is any other appointed act as the conquering of a continent for instance yes now then no man ever does drop a link the thing has never happened even when he is trying to make up his mind as to whether he will do a thing or not that itself is a link an act and has its proper place in his chain and when he finally decides an act that also was the thing which he was absolutely certain to do you see now that a man will never drop a link in his chain he cannot if he had made up his mind to try that project would itself be an unavoidable link a thought bound to occur to him at that precise moment and made certain by the first act of his babyhood it seemed so dismal he is a prisoner for life i said sorrowfully and cannot get free no of himself he cannot get away from the consequences of his first childish act but i can free him i looked up wistfully i have changed the careers of a number of your villagers i tried to thank him but found it difficult and let it drop i shall make some other changes you know that little lisa brant oh yes everybody does my mother says she is so sweet and so lovely that she is not like any other child she says she will be the pride of the village when she grows up and it's idle too just as she is now i shall change her future make it better i asked yes and i will change the future of nicholas i was glad this time and said i don't need to ask about his case you will be sure to do generously by him it is my intention straight off i was building that great future of nicky's in my imagination and had already made a renowned general of him and hofmeister at the court when i noticed that satan was waiting for me to get ready to listen again i was ashamed of having exposed my cheap imaginings to him and was expecting some sarcasms but it did not happen he proceeded with his subject nicky's appointed life is sixty-two years that's grand i said lisa's thirty-six but as i told you i shall change their lives and those ages two minutes and a quarter from now nicholas will wake out of his sleep and find the rain blowing in it was appointed that he should turn over and go to sleep again but i have appointed that he shall get up and close the window first that trifle will change his career entirely he will rise in the morning two minutes later than the chain of his life had appointed him to rise by consequence thenceforth nothing will ever happen to him in accordance with the details of the old chain he took out his watch and sat looking at it a few moments then said nicholas has risen to close the window his life is changed his new career has begun there will be consequences it made me feel creepy it was uncanny but for this change certain things would happen twelve days from now for instance nicholas would save lisa from drowning he would arrive on the scene at exactly the right moment four minutes past ten the long ago appointed instant of time and the water would be shoal the achievement easy and certain but he will arrive some seconds too late now lisa will have struggled into deeper water he will do his best but both will drown oh satan dear satan i cried with tears rising in my eyes 
Save them. Don't let it happen. I can't bear to lose Nicholas. He is my loving playmate and friend. And think of Lisa's poor mother. I clung to him and begged and pleaded, but he was not moved. He made me sit down again and told me I must hear him out. I have changed Nicholas's life and this has changed Lisa's. If I had not done this, Nicholas would save Lisa, then he would catch cold from his drenching. One of your race's fantastic and desolating scarlet fevers would follow, with pathetic after-effects. For forty-six years he would lie in his bed, a paralytic log, deaf, dumb, blind, and praying night and day for the blessed relief of death. Shall I change his life back? Oh, no, oh, oh, not for the world. In charity and pity leave it as it is. It is best so. I could not have changed any other link in his life and done him so good a service. He had a billion possible careers, but not one of them was worth living. They were charged full with miseries and disasters. But for my intervention he would do his brave deed twelve days from now, a deed begun and ended in six minutes, and get for all reward those forty-six years of sorrow and suffering I told you of. It is one of the cases I was thinking of a while ago when I said that sometimes an act which brings the actor an hour's happiness and self-satisfaction is paid for, or punished, by years of suffering. I wondered what poor little Lisa's early death would save her from he answered the thought, from ten years of pain and slow recovery from an accident, and then from nineteen years' pollution, shame, depravity, crime, ending with death at the hands of the executioner. Twelve days hence she will die. Her mother would save her life if she could. Am I not kinder than her mother? Yes, oh, indeed yes, and wiser. Father Peter's case is coming on presently. He will be acquitted through unassailable proofs of his innocence. Why, Satan, how can that be? Do you really think it? Indeed, I know it. His good name will be restored, and the rest of his life will be happy. I can believe it. To restore his good name will have that effect. His happiness will not proceed from that cause. I shall change his life that day for his good. He will never know his good name has been restored. In my mind, and modestly, I asked for particulars, but Satan paid no attention to my thought. Next my mind wandered to the astrologer, and I wondered where he might be. In the moon, said Satan, with a fleeting sound, which I believe was a chuckle. I've got him on the cold side of it, too. He doesn't know where he is, and is not having a pleasant time. Still, it is good enough for him, a good place for his star studies. I shall need him presently, then I shall bring him back and possess him again. He has a long and cruel and odious life before him, but I will change that, for I have no feeling against him, and am quite willing to do him a kindness. I think I shall get him burned. He had strange notions of kindness. But angels are made so, and do not know any better. Their ways are not like our ways, and besides, human beings are nothing to them. They think they are only freaks. It seemed to me odd that he should put the astrologer so far away. He could have dumped him in Germany just as well, where he would be handy. Far away, said Satan. To me no place is far away distance does not exist for me. The sun is less than a hundred million miles from here, and the light that is falling upon us has taken eight minutes to come. But I can make that flight, or any other, in a fraction of time, so minute that it cannot be measured by a watch. I have but to think the journey, and it is accomplished. I held out my hand and said, The light lies upon it. Think it into a glass of wine, Satan. He did. I drank the wine. Break the glass, he said. I broke it. There, you see, it is real. The villagers thought the brass balls were magic stuff and as perishable as smoke. They were afraid to touch them. 
You are a curious lot, your race. But come along, I have business. I will put you to bed. Said and done. Then he was gone, but his voice came back to me through the rain and darkness, saying, Yes, tell Seppi, but no other. It was the answer to my thought. End Chapter 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during April 2008.